So, um, thank you first of all for all speakers. Uh, my first question is actually to Kevin uh, with regard to uh, Professor Diane's uh, comment on the impact of, sorry, yes, on the impact of uh, current use of uh, uh, genetically modified uh, organisms or biotechnological aspects of genetically modified organisms. So to what extent these products have made an impact so far uh, relative to uh, standard breeding or mutagenized crops? Well, it, it, it was stated that we don't know the impacts, and if there is a positive impact, but thousands of farmers, well, millions of farmers worldwide use, utilize the technology because it does pay for them every year. Uh, for field crops, for field crops, right, not for horticultural crops yet. Um, the thing that I found profoundly disappointing was really a very selective presentation of data, and, you know, with all due respect, um, she shows that there was uh, contamination of maize in Mexico, but failed to show you the pr outstanding work by Dr. Sol Ortiz Ar Garcia. So if you take out your smartphone, you can look that up. Uh, her many follow-up reports that showed that that was not reproducible and likely artifacts of the detection process. Um, showed, I showed yesterday, yes, glyphosate increases with the use of these crops, but I also showed you yesterday that atrazine and other herbicides that are much more environmentally impactful and hazardous for health decreased. So the net was a positive. She didn't show you that. And it boils down to, you know, there's, in this discussion, who do we trust for information and who's preventing, presenting the entire side of the discussion? And it's a really good lesson for all of you who were there yesterday. For that glyphosate, it's figure 2C of Duke et al. 2012. And so when you're hearing claims about the negative sides of these or the positive sides, make sure that you're looking at all the literature and all the review and not just the stuff that backs your uh, opinion. And make sure that you're really paying attention to the uh, scope of the relevant research. Tamara, if you want to comment. Yes, thank you. First, Kevin, I was not supposed to give your talk. I was supposed to present the ecological aspects. And as I said, there are problems, detectable problems. I said the jury is still out at some of them. Some of them are greater, some of them are smaller, but it would be pretty silly to ignore them. And to the question, who do we trust? Obviously, people don't trust you if we are going to be personal, because if people trusted you, there would be no problems with regulation. So in terms of trust, I read only good scientific material good scientific publications, and they are not in the biotechnology field. There are a lot of examples in the literature, and as I said, I'm surveying the literature. I'm not, this is not my original research. I went over all the publications. There are a lot of examples where genes came to places where they were not expected to be, or were in countries where not expected to be, and they were a very big, unpleasant surprise. It would be silly to ignore that. Okay. Um, yes, another comment, Tamar, please. Tamar, uh, most of the publications that you presented were from 2005. And uh, what, what about uh, current, uh, you know, it's uh, more than 10 years. Uh. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why it didn't change. I read, I spent the last few nights reading on the 2016 and 2017 literature. And what happens is that they go in the footprints of the previous studies, but they go into detail. They go into the question of phenology of the lipidopterans and phenology of the pollinators, other pollinators and phenology of the plants. They go into a lot of details. There is nothing new that's out of the scheme that was actually placed several years ago. And that's what I said. There are a lot of dots. They're not connected yet. It's really difficult to do in ecology. I can only point to the things that came up, come up in the recent literature, and are things that people are concerned about. I, as ecologists, I put the 2000 as a backdrop because actually all the concerns that were raised in 2000 are still the concerns that are being studied today. I want to say something that I've talked with Shlomo about earlier, and you all mentioned a very friendly committee in Israel, in the and it's an interesting phenomenon that the committee has six scientists and they're all plant biotechnologists. It's a little bit like deciding that Israel's nuclear 
uh, uh, policies will be decided by six nuclear engineers, who may be brilliant nuclear engineers, but they will be, of course, positive to nuclear power. But there are many other considerations that could be ecological, economic. If our market doesn't want it, that's a good enough reason not to do it, even if we don't know what's happening in our environment, and we won't know because it's not being studied by anyone in the country, for example. So it's a really complex issue. I can't say my, my sense personally, my intuition says that this is going to be a little like nuclear power that the first, second, and third generation are nothing to write home about, and that the fourth and fifth generation will do important things, and that the research needs to continue. But my sense also is that the use, actual use, did not factor in a lot of things that should and can be factored in. And some of them are ecological, not only ecological, others are social, others are economic, others are legal. I believe in regulation. Um, let, I, I, would like, I would like to move to, to the next question to the entire panel, and that is, we've been talking about plants, very little about animals, but I just wanted to mention, and maybe to have uh, the comment from all of you, and that is we have been using genetically modified, um, biotechnologically modified organisms, mainly in the industry of dairy and beer, uh, which we've all been using for many years, which are going back into the environment. So why are we less concerned of those genetically modified organisms uh, as opposed to plants? Kevin, please. Yeah, I'm unsure. It's again another good example of the intellectual inconsistency of this discussion. Um, the fact that we use genetically, we talked about insulin and obesity and we inject ourselves with genetically engineered human genes and bacteria, no problem. And uh, the, all of the enzymes that are used in cheese making, 95% uh, of cheese come from genetic engineering. Uh, and, uh, and the other one you mentioned was a good one too. Yeah, the yeast that are used frequently in fermentation. So it's a, it's a very um, uh, unusual argument for me that we accept it in many places but not in others. And I can also add uh, from uh, Kevin's uh, presentation, so all the other way of, uh, of mutations that we use for a long, uh, a long time is not regulated and, and uh, no research was done on that or the crosses that we make with, uh, with uh, wild species. So I really think that there is inconsistency, inconsistency uh, of the public. In, uh, Tamar, would you like to comment? Or? Uh, Shlomo? It's not only the question of uh, yes or no GMO, uh, uh, GMO uh, co uh, co uh, co uh, corpse uh, cultivation. It's, only, it's also, uh, we have to consider this uh, matter if in the way how uh, that we have uh, to use the GMO crops in a rational way. For, exa uh, for, for example, if we talk about the glyphosate, the, uh, 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 about the uh, glyphosate, uh, if we uh, want to keep the, the wild crops or the wild herbs will not get the resistance, we have to work with the rational means that uh, might avoid the, the damage that uh, might be with the commercial uh, GMO crops. Okay. I want to say something for the animals. Uh, there's a lot of insect life and in fields, in agricultural fields. There's a lot of trends in the world, including to some extent in the United States, to try and bolster pollinator populations because they're incredibly important economically, to bolster natural pests, natural uh, uh, predators of crop pests because they're really important uh, in, in terms of pest control. There's a lot of approaches, alternative approaches to agriculture. They probably all have their merits, 
But the main thing is not uh, we have technology, so let's use it. We need to think in a big way about agriculture and fruit production today, and we need to think in a big way about ecology today. And uh, we know that there are effects of GMO crops. We know there are effects of agriculture in general. As I said, agriculture is a very, it has a huge environmental impact all over the world in general. If this was a plea for more regulation, maybe that's what the plea was, but you're not pleading for, pleading for more regulation. You're pleading for deregulating something. And for the deregulation, I think one needs to look at and, uh, and uh, balance all aspects. In a country like Israel, for example, the country is very small. There's no place for buffers. There's international issues with the Palestinians and the other adjacent countries. There are many, we are market as Europe, which is resistant to GMO crops. So our considerations should be wide range considerations and they're beyond the question of can we do it now and can we do it precisely. And I think all of this should be factored in in the discussion. And possibly it will come and possibly with next generations will be also a brilliant thing to do. But I think the issues are incredibly complex and they're beyond the technology. So, okay, thank you. I have one more question for Kevin. So, taking into account what cannot be used today, that we have the tools, what are we losing presently from not using available tools generated by uh, genetic engineering? Yeah, and that's the sad part um, because pr the public sector is generated, including much in this country tremendous resources that can dramatically cut insecticide use, that can dramatically uh, enhance the nutritional content of fruits and vegetables, especially in the developing world. And those don't have ecological impacts. They're simply increasing the uh, vitamin A content, you know, the stuff in carrots, uh, beta carotene uh, content, the same thing that can be achieved by natu natural traditional breeding, only it's faster. Uh, uh, resistance to drought, resistance to heat and cold, uh, flooding. Uh, so all of the biotic and abiotic stresses, uh, there's just, there's dozens of important traits that could help agriculture and ecology, but we don't use them because of regulation. So perhaps uh, one more question, and that is, uh, and that's mainly for Tamar. In view of the new technologies uh, using gene editing, um, though it is limited because uh, the technology which is approved so far is just modifying particular nucleotides rather than inserting new material or add-on material like selection genes. Uh, would this be uh, more feasible uh, for the community to absorb or for us to absorb as a community in terms of the ecological concerns? I, my my guess is yes, but I'm going to say something that I have yet to hear a plant biotechnologist say. I don't know enough about it. <laughs> yes, Shlomo, please. Sorry, yes. I want to emphasize a point that I miss in my presentation. The Israeli NTCP decision was about uh, CRISPR-Cas9 with the knockout uh, approach, not in the knock-in uh, right. approach. And this is a great uh, difference. Right, right. So we have still uh, probably one question, for, or maybe a bit more from the public. Let's start fast from, <laughs> for fast answers. Let's start with students at the back. Yes, please, Ido.
You were missing something. No. <laughs> The, the thing is, we have a lot of problems with invasive species in general, which can also many of them are wild species, not agricultural. The worry is that the genes that these species will carry will give them an edge, an advantage, that will make dealing with them much harder if they're resistant to herbicides or if they're resistant to predation by insects. And that's the, and that's the, that's the worry. It's not that it's unique to spread, it's unique to have the genes to be resistant, that's all. No, it does claim as if we're breeding for the same trait and that has not been shown any advantage, why are we worried about uh, the new technologies bringing the same uh, features to the same agricultural plants? Uh, yes. How do we deal with GM seeds? You mean the new gene technology editing? We'll not go into it. It's a long process. I, I leave this to... Both patenting and monitoring is a complex issue. We would not go into it at this, at this session. One last question. Yes, Michael. So the issue of gene drives has many different sociological edges as well as uh, technical edges. That still is being hotly discussed and, it, and we are considering all ecological and sociological impacts as we do do with everything. And, and, and the, um, the ones that are more promising are these sterile insect techniques that Oxitech is using for diamondback moth, mos uh, mosquito, and for now fall armyworm, which could be devastating in Africa. Uh, these new techniques, and that's an invasive species. So here we're using technology to control an invasive species. Those technologies look extremely promising and are just a augmentation of what's currently being done in a standard sterile insect technique, just much more precise. Anybody else wants to comment? Okay. Um, I think we have just seen some of the most uh, appreciated uh, convention between uh, the different uh, stakeholders and this is what we need to keep doing to keep an open dialogue uh, between all parties involved in order to allow us to make the best products for the best for the better of uh, humanity uh, with the least uh, concerns so I thank all participants all speakers we'll have a half an hour break